Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this Sunday service for the Church of the Eternally Secure. I am very happy to be back with everybody again today, finally. Um, let's. Uh, we got uh, some good questions to uh, look forward to discussing, but today is uh, Communion Day. So if you have not only prepared, uh, get your wine and your bread ready. And we will be having communion together very shortly. Uh, let's, let's start off by saying hello to everybody. And Sister Renee, why don't you say hi to the congregation? You got it. Hello, beloved saints. Um, so happy to see Brother Luke back. Uh, he probably won't tell you this, but he is not at 100%. Uh, as you guys know, he does have the coronavirus. He's been very sick for two weeks. He's still very weak, and uh, his his voice is not strong yet. So uh, if we see him getting a little faint or having a hard time talking or breathing, we're going to let him take a break here and encourage him that he do so. Uh, I'm very grateful that he's back with us today. But I would ask all of you to keep him in your thoughts and prayers as we proceed today. And I'm sorry I didn't do a video to remind my viewers about communion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sister. Uh, all right, brother Ben, say hi to everybody. Hello, everyone. It's so good that uh, Luke is back, and so great to have you back, brother. And um, I'm looking forward to the, to the service with the with the full panel again. So. It's such a, a great blessing to have you back, Luke, and to see you turn the corner. Okay, thank you, brother. Um, well, I guess I'll say just take a minute here to, to report on this experience. Uh, I, I've done everything I could the last eight or nine months to avoid being contaminated. I've been trying to be super careful, not hardly leaving my house and done everything. My wife and I have both been very careful, but somehow I ended up getting infected. And <clears throat> I know that uh, everybody's experience is different. There's ranges of sickness. And some people, it's not so bad. In my case, it was real bad. Uh, it's, it's the sickest I've felt in my whole life. And it, it lasted to pretty much exactly two weeks. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I, a couple of days ago, I noticed I actually improved from one day to the next. And uh, so I've been getting a little bit better each day. <clears throat> and so now I'm pretty much uh, uh, at least feeling well enough that I can talk a little bit and, and uh, join everybody. So I've, I know how much everybody's prayed for me and uh, I greatly appreciate all everybody's prayers. And I pray that uh, nobody else has to go through this. Uh, all right, uh, Ben, you said you have a, a request for the congregation you wanted to make. Oh, well, just, just in general, um, there's some administrative things that uh, I spend a- You there, uh, Ben? Oh, sorry about that. Yes. Um, yes, there's some administrative things that I spend a fair amount of time on every week that uh, would be helpful if someone would be interested in you know helping to share that uh, load a little bit. Um, so, for example, uh, every week we get true false statements uh, submitted, and it takes a while to uh, uh, maintain those, or at least you know, uh, you know, get them in organized and, and, and collect them, and uh, choose a set every week uh, between one to five questions. I'm uh, sorry, five to ten questions. Um, say for Sunday service, we get a set of questions uh, it, 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 that we get from all different sources and they need to be uh, again kind of aggregated collected and then every week uh, uh, a set of five or so uh, need to be selected that we can uh, comment on uh, music as well uh, music for the um, Sunday service uh, hymns uh, we have a, a set now but we could always uh, use a variety so any suggestions you guys anyone would have about music uh, obviously we have to use music that's not um, that we're not going to get a strike on because of uh, uh, licensing or uh, royalty type of of considerations, and so we look for, we we need to select music that's under the category of Creative Commons, uh, and that's something again. If you're interested in, uh, you can uh, contact the church, and I can give you more information about. Uh, and then finally, 
Um, I think it'd be really helpful if on the Friday programs and on the Sunday questions, um, on the Sunday programs, if we could, uh, if someone would be willing to watch those and then every time a, a, a certain question is posed or true, true or false statement is uh, proposed, that someone can mark the time in the video and what the question was or the true false statement was so that we can provide um, a reference to people who who are viewing the video for the first time, they maybe want to skip to a certain question, or even just for uh, archive purposes, uh, when people want to go back in time, and say, okay, what did we, what was, what was, what was said about that particular question? We can search that on our channel, so we can search that question and find out exactly what video uh, addressed that question or true false statement, and uh, they can, you know, uh, they can have a link directly to that. Uh, I think that would all be helpful. But it, those are things, all things I've been working on, but it just. Uh, not able to consistently do it because of uh, time constraints. So if that's something you're interested in, any of those four activities, um, please send an email to the Church of the Eternally Secure. Actually, I should say it's not it's not the church. It's just Church of the Eternally Secure at gmail dot com, and um, I'd be happy to work with you on uh, any of those. So thanks. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, Renee, any announcements you need to make? Yes. Um, I heard back from Gary Wayne, the author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, and he said that he would do a live stream to continue speaking with us uh, on January 7th. That is a Thursday at 9 p.m. I will do a video to uh, remind everyone. But he is going to come back. Uh, for another conversation with us. Okay. All right. Awesome. Uh, all right. Let's 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 talk about prayer needs. Uh, <clears throat> of course, I'm happy for everybody's continued prayers for me. My wife is also uh, sick, and but her symptoms never got near as bad as mine. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, pray for our, my family. I also have a other relatives here in Las Vegas that, that uh, somehow uh, several of them are really quite sick with this COVID also. And so pray for all of them. And uh, um, Renee, who, who, what prayer needs do you want to mention? Well, uh, every week I, I've been lifting up a lot of the same people now for about a year. Uh, we want to can, continue to pray for Anthony Suarez for his kidney transplant, Jennifer Petty for her health issues, as well as sister Lisa uh, for her health. But, um, Please, uh, Brother Luke, you know, I'm, I'm, I was so, so concerned and I'm, I'm so happy you had so many people praying for you. Uh, please continue to do so. Please keep all of us on the panel and all of the grace preachers, you know, keep them in prayer. Um, but this week I am going to ask for prayers for my family, um, for my son's aunt Brooke. And for myself, uh, Brooke uh, stays here with my son and I now, uh, and she is also disabled. Um, I'm asking for my family during the holidays. Uh, there'll be travel. I'll be seeing family, my mother uh, and uh, my father and his wife and my sister and her husband and my niece. Just keep all of us in prayer. Um, and for the church, there's so many young people um, getting a lot of uh, emails. And by the way, if you've emailed me with questions uh, or contacted me lately, it's been a few days since I've even uh, looked at my email. So uh, except to specifically get this. Uh, so I will get back to you. But I see a lot of young people, 15, 16 years old, concerned for their salvation. It really warms my heart that they would care about spiritual things. Uh, so pray for the young people um, that are new to the body of Christ and for the saints. There's so much fear uh, and uh, we're, we're partly to blame for that with all of these fear mongering conspiracy videos constantly. Uh, the information needs to be vetted a lot more than it is before it's passed on as some kind of fact to trouble the saints. And uh, there's people that have entire channels that just do that. 
and none of the information's vetted and the saints are stressed out and worried that they're going to be dragged from their houses and have their heads cut off and it's just you know we're supposed to trust in the lord and think on good things and occupy till he comes uh, the lord gives us what we need daily so i'm praying for the saints uh that they don't get so troubled and this this climate of fear and anxiety is, is taken from them uh paul says we can do all things through christ which strengthens us so i'm hoping that more of us uh will come to live that truth you know i just see a lot of anxiety and fear in the body of christ so i I'm lifting up everyone today. Amen. Okay. Uh, Brother Ben, uh, what prayer needs are you aware of? Are there any prayer needs in, listed in the chat room yet? Uh, I just saw, I, I skimmed through, and only what I'm seeing um, is from Sister Heather. And she says, pre please pray for my cousin Janet, who just learned that she has two types of cancer. Wow. She recovered from cervical cancer a few years ago and now has kidney cancer and lung cancer. So definitely uh, he has our prayers. And uh, again, again, I would just again continue to ask you to pray for Brother Luke for his full and complete recovery. Um, and But that's all I see uh, in chat and that's all I have. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, if there's uh, if there's no other prayer needs, let's do this now. We'll, we're going to take 30 seconds, and we ask the whole congregation right now take 30 seconds and pray for all of these needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> okay. All right. Got my camera turned back on. Let me see. How do you like my hairdo? Is it looking pretty good? Yeah, you, you comb your hair like Fonzie. <laughs> well, he's my, in my era, Fonzie. Oh, what, what did he say? Did he have some clever, you know, cute Hey. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, now I, I always mix up the hymns and the communion. I think we do communion and then hymns, but I'm not sure. Uh, Luke, do you also comment you want to do some, something about the what gospel in a sentence? Uh, oh yes, yes, please. Uh, thank you, thank you for reminding me. So uh, if you'll post it, post it right now. Uh, I'll yep, explain uh, to everybody because this is something new that we've uh, uh, adopted. Yep, it's playing now. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, um, a few weeks ago, um, before I got sick, uh, I felt there was a need to try to put the, the, the gospel message, and I'm not talking about the gospel, is just in the 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, but the, the message that we want to explain to someone and understand and believe as concisely as possible. And uh, I've heard people saying that uh, all you got to do is believe Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe he's the Son of God, then you're saved. And I've heard so many different things. It's being expressed so many ways. I felt there's a need to, to try to put this into words uh, so that um, we can see that. What is the content? What is it we need to a person to understand and believe uh, as concisely as possible? So I wrote this and Ben edited it, and uh, this is what we came up with. So we will we will read this and uh, at the beginning and the end of each um, Sunday service uh, going forward. The gospel in one sentence. God became a man, Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross to pay for all our sins and was raised bodily from the dead to guarantee the gift of eternal life and heaven 
to all who believe that Christ alone provides salvation and eternal life through faith in him alone. <clears throat> now, I know that uh, if everybody was tasked with writing uh, in one sentence uh, the gospel, we'd all come up with a little bit, hopefully uh, not too far from this. We probably wouldn't come up with exactly the same thing, but I think that uh, everything that I, I feel a person really needs to know it is condensed into this one sentence. So um, I, I hope everybody can understand that uh, uh, we all need to uh, agree as a congregation that, if, you know, what what is it required? What is it we expect someone to understand and believe so we can accept them as, as uh, be believers as we are? And that this is what we came up with. <clears throat> ben, would you want to say anything about it since you helped to, to write it? Uh, no, I think you, you covered it well. I think it. Uh, we know it's not the most uh, well structured sentence, but it 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 was a it was a point to say that we can you can uh, encapsulate the gospel in a single sentence. And I think uh, Luke and I uh, kind of uh, wordsmithed it, and we got it to a point where I think it's pretty concise. Yep, it's who he is and what he's done and what that means. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, what it means means that you you understand that uh, eternal life is promised and guaranteed to you by Jesus. So that's eternal security. Um, all right. Um, all right. Thank you uh, for your help with that, Ben and Renee. I'll, uh, I guess so. Uh, nothing left to be done before the, uh, the communion now, is there? Am I forgetting anything? No, sir. Okay. Then let's let's go forward with the communion. And uh, Renee, tell us... Uh, uh, this uh, cautionary uh, message from the Apostle Paul. Yes, uh, you may have heard this many times. It's a warning. Uh, often ministers, preachers, pastors will give this warning to the congregation before uh, doing the uh, bread and the wine. Now, unfortunately, this is interesting. I spoke to a pastor that's starting to pastor a new church last week, and he said that one of the first things he was going to do was communion. And he realized when he asked the congregation how many of them had taken communion, most of them had rejected the communion when it was passed around because they thought, as mo most preachers preach, that they were unworthy because they had some kind of sin. Now, all of us would admit in our flesh, we still fail. Most people just don't recognize sin for what it is, that the thoughts and intents of our heart, the things that we say, we all fall short of God's glory. None of us are perfect. And so if this warning were about us being worthy based on our merits, nobody would take communion and everybody would eat and drink damnation to themselves. So uh, the warning here, he said it, it released a lot of fear and it brought a lot of joy to his congregation because there are some people that had only taken communion maybe one or twice, but when they had gotten the warning, they stayed away from it, fearing that they would drink damnation in themselves because they weren't the perfect Christian. You see, and that's very sad because Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him, to remember his death till he come. This is us communing, partaking, in intimacy with our Lord. So it, nothing should take it away from you. So I'm going to read the warning here and tell you correctly in its context what they were doing. They were eating, overeating, for, uh, forgetting the poor, not taking care of the poor congregation. So they were eating it all, getting gluttonous, and getting drunk on the wine at the Lord's Supper. Instead of meditating on what his body was broken for, instead of meditating on his blood shed for our sin and keeping it a, a holy and reverent, very solemn, serious event, an intimate event with the Lord, they treated it like a party. So they were eating and drinking unworthily. Okay, it was the action of eating and drinking that, that was unworthily done. It was not they were unworthy. They were unworthy 
because of how they were eating and drinking. With that being said, now you can look at it. You should never abstain from taking communion because you know you're not perfect in your flesh. Uh, positionally, Jesus has made us perfect. He has declared us righteous. We should all strive to be the best Christian we we can. Um, but this is not what it's talking about. So let's look at it. The warning is, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And it continues, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And it talks about the chastening of the Lord. And it's because of how they were treating the body and blood um, that they were being so irreverent. Um, so damnation is a strong word there. It's more like condemnation. Uh, you see there, it says many were sick and weakly. You know, some of them hadn't been healed of it because of this and others had even died early. So um, that is the context of it. So uh, always remember that this is a solemn event, a time of intimacy and uh, retrospection of of what Jesus has done for us. That's what we need to meditate on. Take it very seriously and realize it's a holy uh, set apart moment. Okay, amen. Thank you, sister. I always love, love how you explain that. It's uh, <clears throat> so misunderstood. Uh, I'd say that there's two extreme factions of people uh, in Christendom, or how they deal with this question of communion. One group believes that uh, it's necessary uh, for salvation. It's a, it's a requirement. It's a means of salvation to take communion. Uh, well, we know that it's not required. Uh, only the faith alone in Christ alone is all that's required for their salvation. But uh, there's another group at the far end of the other side of this question that, that they actually forbid it and say that it's not for the church. It, it served its purpose, but it's not. This is this is a people called hyper dispensationalists. So what is the right attitude? Uh, the, the right an answer to the question is that we don't have to do it, but it's a privilege and it's a duty because uh, Jesus actually commanded it. He said, this do in remembrance of me. So it's we're doing it because Jesus told us to do it. That's, that's as simple as that. And so uh, if you have your bread and your wine ready, uh, read the scriptures and, and follow along with me, please. <clears throat> And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, Ben, is there anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, I'm ready for the hymns if you are. Okay. All right, let's go forward with that. Some hymns. All right.
She came in the nick of time Won't you tell him that you need him Won't you tell him that you need him Don't you tell him that you need him Don't you ever tell him that you need him Won't you tell him that you need him I need him Oh, I need him in my life Cause if I didn't have him I'd be lost in my sin I'm gonna praise him Jesus Christ is my song Makes me sing Ain't nobody gonna make me feel the way you do, Lord Ain't nobody gonna make me feel the way that you do, Lord Sin and you made me born again. I just want to thank you. Give your praise and worship only up to Him. Oh, you should only give your praise and worship, only give it up to Him.
second song was new i i don't recognize hearing that before uh how'd you come up with that one ben that was recommended by heather um uh, so i hope okay. you enjoyed it all right thank you heather uh, <clears throat> all right i guess uh and if i'm not forgetting anything i guess it's time now to go into the discussion and the questions uh ben i i still can't access the questions on the email so plus it's probably smarter today anyway to not for me not to read it um, why don't you read the questions uh, for, for us, Ben? Okay, give me one second here. Um, okay, the first question is, it says, Lordship argu argument for losing salvation is that we do not have eternal security and nothing we can do can lose it. Only if we stay grounded on the gospel. The same thing that gets us saved, faith in the gospel, is the same thing that forfeits salvation, unbelief. I.e., continual unbelief can make you lose your salvation. Please refute. All right. Okay, Sister Renee, could you follow that? Yeah, okay. So what they're saying is, if you stay in unbelief long enough, you lose it? Is that, is that what it's saying? All right. So, salvation is an event. It's a birth process. It happens in a moment. It is a spiritual event. Uh, it has nothing to do with how great our faith is. Uh, what happened was we realized we were sinners. We heard the message of what Christ did on Calvary. We said, yes, please. I need that. So I'm going to trust he did that to save me. Now, I don't know of anyone personally that has heard the true gospel message. Now, I've, I've heard many people claim to be Christians and say they're now atheists. But when I asked them what their message was, it was Jesus plus 
you've got to keep all these commandments. And what happened was they got sick of feeling like they had to live up to something that was impossible. And so they left it. Well, they weren't saved anyway. They were still trying to work their way to heaven. Uh, and you'll hear the resentment in their vo voice. They'll say things like, yeah, God's going to just, uh, and, and then here comes the eternal torment thing. God's just going to burn me forever if I don't live up to some impossible rules he put down or so, something like that. Just some kind of resentful. So it tells me, one, they don't have revelation of God's love for them. They've never understood grace. They've never put their trust in what Jesus actually did. Now, I, I don't know how somebody can know something's true because it is true. He did die and rise again. We know that. Our faith is not based on blindness or hope so. Our faith is based on the evidence of all the people that saw him risen and then their behavior after they saw him risen that supports they really did see him. And so uh, I, I don't know how somebody knows something's true and then all of a sudden says it's not true anymore because to me it's not belief. It's yeah, of course he rose from the dead. So, and if he rose from the dead, then what the Bible says is true. Uh, and it all makes perfect sense. So I, I can't, I can't fathom how somebody would, would think something that's true just isn't true anymore. I, I don't know how somebody gets to that place. However, um, that's the only message that counts for salvation. So in the improbable possibility that someone could trust only in what Jesus did uh, and then decide what they did. He didn't really rise from the dead. Cause I mean, that's the only thing that could make you stop believing is that you believe Jesus really didn't die or he didn't rise from the dead. Suppose somebody came to that conclusion. Well, we see in first Corinthians that uh, they were denying the bodily resurrection. So if you stop denying that, if you don't deny the bodily resurrection, you don't have any hope for your life. But it doesn't say you lost salvation. Uh, so there, there's no way to lose salvation. Now, now, here's what I'd say. This is a difficult question, because I know that once you trust Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you and he is the spirit of truth. Right. So I just don't know how that could happen. I, I know it's happened many times with people in Lordship Salvation, but I don't believe most of those were saved anyway, because what happens, like I said, is they get fed up with thinking that they have to live up to some standard or they think God's not good or whatever. And then they just get tired of it and they leave. So to me, they were never convinced of his actual resurrection to begin with. And they didn't understand what his death and resurrection did for us. So I don't think they were saved anyway. They didn't believe it. Um, so there's a lot of professors out there that I think aren't, aren't really safe, but it, the improbable possibility that a person could believe correctly, that they're convinced of what Jesus has done and then be unconvinced. Well, it doesn't mean you lose your salvation. The Bible says that in the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It doesn't mean that they lost salvation. It, it means that they lost their victory. They lost their hope. Uh, they lost a lot of things, um, but not salvation. The Bible says, you know, uh, if we deny service to him, then he will deny reigning uh, with him. And it, but even if we believe not yet, he abides faithful, can't deny himself. So whatever he's promised, it's not contingent on you and your continued faithfulness. It's, it's based on Jesus and his promise. So uh, again, I think it's very unlikely that a person gets a true conversion. The Holy Spirit dwells within them. And somehow, now we know faith can be shipwrecked. I believe it can be shipwrecked. They can start believing things that are wrong. That's possible. Uh, but even then, God doesn't forsake us. But I believe that a person, if they really understood the gospel, they were born of God. I don't think if they're, if they somehow doubted or went into that, that it, it, they'd probably come around. 
But even if they didn't, God, God's faithful. God keeps you. Uh, I've never seen a person, I've said, have people claim it. But when I talk to them about the gospel, they really don't understand it. Like they don't understand imputed righteousness. They never understood why what he did uh, paid for all our debt, why it had to be only what he did. They still thought it was something about what they were doing. So whenever I see people leaving the faith or claiming they used to believe, when I dig down deeper, I realize they never really understood the gospel and they probably never really believed it. So um, I don't want to take the loophole that, oh, they just never were saved to begin with. But I think it's a great possibility, especially when John says they went out from us because they were not of us. Um, so I, I think that that is more than likely what happens. But clearly, if someone if someone was saved, born of God, it doesn't matter how long they went to unbelief. They are not keeping themselves saved. God is keeping them saved. They've already been born into God's family as his child. It cannot be undone. They were dead in trespass and sins. They were quickened by the spirit. So it can't be undone. It doesn't matter what the person's doing or how great his faith is or how great it's not. It's Jesus that keeps us. He is the author and finisher of our faith. It is God that preserves and keeps the saints, not us not our faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, well, if anybody's been with CES very long and you've been paying attention at all, you know that we, we had a, a schism uh, in the church uh, over this very question. And uh, some people had to go a, a different way because of this disagreement that they believe that uh, if a person has a crisis of faith, uh, either uh, losing their faith or having doubts, um, or if they go, go into apostasy, if they no longer believe the gospel correctly and believe in faith plus works, <clears throat> that th this is absolute proof that they n never had a real conversion, that they never got saved in the first place. <clears throat> and that's, this was the uh, point of contention. Um, those of us who are still with CES, uh, we're on the side that uh, there is such a thing as a uh, person who gets saved and, and goes into either apostasy or has some kind of crisis of faith. We've spent a lot of time talking about it in the past, uh, and uh, it's easy to illustrate in the scriptures uh, uh, we believe that the, the book of Galatians is primarily about that very point. Uh, it's talking to the church that actually had this experience where it says that they're brethren, they're believers, they have the Holy Spirit, and they're uh, all these, all the terms that only are uh, uh, solely ex uh, uh, appointed to it for believers, saved believers. He, Paul identifies them as saved over and over in every possible way. And yet he has to chastise them for uh, ended up believing that faith plus works uh, are, uh, necess uh, are, are necessary. Uh, so it's, there's, it's clear that from the scriptures that there are uh, two possibilities uh, for, for any one of these individuals in question. Uh, one group would be someone who never really did believe. Um, and um, either they didn't believe uh, correctly and understand the gospel, or they were a pretender. Uh, that, uh, that's what I believe the tares are. Uh, the wheat and the tares, scripture says that they're side by side, they grow together. So that's a picture of being in this congregation right here, uh, people, you know, sitting next to each other, working closely together, both professing their faith, and yet one of them is not a real wheat. It looks like wheat, but it's not real. It's a, a pretender. Uh, that's the tares. So you, you have the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, and, and the book of Galatians, all these things are, show us that there is a group of people who uh, are like that, that uh, they're not real believers. And Paul says that there is also, uh, he identifies them as, well, 
the reason they'd left us is because they were never really part of us. So this is uh, people who never really believed correctly and got saved and, and they never did get saved and that's why they left. They, they never did have this common faith that we share. <clears throat> and then, but then there's the other group of people that, yeah, they really did get saved and it's impossible for them to, as, Paul, as Jesus says, uh, you can't go back into your mother's womb and undo your birth. It's the same thing with the new birth, the spiritual birth. You cannot undo that and reverse it. So uh, there are people who truly got saved uh, and now they no longer believe or they, they believe a false gospel and they are just as saved as any of us uh, and secure, except they're well, what I would call saved non-believers. They don't believe it anymore. Uh, so, but we know that there are these two groups but it's impossible for any of us to actually know for sure which group an individual fits in. Or did they have a conversion and, and now they're a saved non-believer? Or did they never really have a conversion in the first place? So my conclusion after a lot of talk about this subject for several years now, is that it doesn't make any sense to, and it's very unwise to try to judge other people's salvation in, the, in this uh, area. We, we, we should not try to make that judgment. Uh, uh, all, all we can go by is their confession of faith today. If a person tells me today that they, they can read that uh, one minute gospel message that we read earlier and confess that's what I believe, then uh, uh, I, 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 there's no reason for me to, to judge whether it's a sincere confession or, or if it's pure faith or some kind of lesser quality of faith. We shouldn't be making those judgments at, at all. Um, but if a person is having doubts and having a, or goes into apostasy, we do need to share the gospel with them and, and uh, give them the scriptures that, so they, to remind them what they, what they believed. And hopefully they'll... Uh, they'll remember and and, uh, and believe again. Uh, okay, Ben, I know you, this is a subject close to your heart. <laughs> Indeed it is, and it, uh, there's so much that could be said, so I'll try to be concise and short. Um, uh, absolutely, a, a, a salvation is a momentary, it's an event, not a process, and God does not put you on probation and say, okay, well, uh, if you continue to believe, I'll continue to keep you in my body, but if you stop believing, I'm going to cut my hand off or whatever part that, of the body that you uh, uh, were of his. Uh, he doesn't, he's not, he's not, he, God, God is done uh, uh, destroying Christ's body. Uh, that was done at the cross. Uh, now he's building it up. Um, and there's there's no way that it's absurd to think that your, your belief could, keeps God, uh, keeps your preservation in Christ. A countless verses take over and over again that, uh, and I think God's intentionally redundant in giving us multiple examples to show us it's an it's an event, not a process. So, for example, in the Gospel of John, it's it's likened to looking. Look, look to the Son and believe. Look, look and live. Look to the look to the Son of Man and, and believe and live. Uh, drinking the woman at the well. Drinking. It's a it's a one time gulp. Uh, it's uh, it's an eating. Uh, whoever eats my drinks my blood and eats my body, uh, so it, it's it's so clear. Like uh, whoever believes in me, John six forty seven, uh, has passed from death to life. It's a permanent thing. Just like you can't be unborn in the flesh, you can't be unborn uh, in the spirit. And so, and uh, it you know I, I agree with Renee. It is very difficult for me to. Uh, to contemplate or to grasp how someone who who, who believed uh, would stop believing, yet I don't. That to me, that's leaning, and so it's tempting to me to to read scripture and and to lean on my understanding to say, okay, well, I, that could happen to me. Which, if by the way, uh, the first time you, when you start to think that way, it will never happen to me. You're already uh, ready for a fall. You need to be a guard against those things, and uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't put any confidence in my flesh whatsoever. And um, or even my ability to to continue to believe. Um, I mean, anything could happen in the future that I have, I can't even 
you know, it's like saying you, you know what the future is going to be like. Some there's some deception that you're immune to or something else. Um, I, anyone's susceptible to it. In fact, uh, I will say just uh, since I started with this church a, a year ago, uh, I am dumbfounded about people that I I I uh, uh, who I have no doubts. That, I I I personally have no doubts that they're saved. But I've seen them go into even though they don't haven't gone into complete unbelief, they have gone into false doctrine. And, uh, and I'm shocked by it, you know, again, so if I were to lead on my own understanding and say, oh, that could never happen because it can never happen to me, or I trust this person, it'll never happen to them. They're very stable. Um, I think that I've seen firsthand people go into grave error. And, um, and again, the parable of the sower teaches that, that people believe for a while. And I believe only the third soil or the, only the first soil is unsaved. The third soil is not, is the one that, uh, is the one that perseveres, and that's why they produce so much fruit, or bear much fruit, I should say. Uh, and and people would say, oh well, no, see that's actually about um, about people who had an artificial belief, because uh, if you read the uh, the account in Matthew, uh, it says only the last soil understood. Well, again, uh, there's a reason for that. And again, I I believe the whole parable of the soil so, of the sower is not an illustration of uh, to teach. Uh, who's saved and who's not saved? It's it's Christ preparing his disciples to say, "Hey, I'm sending you out on a missionary journey, and what you're not going to be 100 percent successful. Don't be surprised if people fall away. Don't be surprised if not everyone is converted. It's not it's not the message or the seed that's at fault. It's the heart or the soil that's at fault. Um, and so you need to, he's sending them, giving them expectations. And why there's a difference between Matthews and Luke's is, again, one of the key emphasis is the Matthews gospel is, uh, it's, uh, it's about the kingdom, the, the, it's, it's about explaining to the world and to the Jews, primarily to a, Judea, a Jewish audience, that the king came and the kingdom was, was postponed. And why is that? It's because his people had no understanding. And that's why understanding is the emphasis in um, in Matthew's gospel. If you look at the surrounding context, it's all about them, uh, their, their hearts waxed gross, they closed their ears, they closed their eyes. Where in Matthew's gospel, it's more of a Jewish, I'm sorry, Luke's gospel, it's more of a Gentile audience. And um, and again, that's why the understanding is not such a problem because the, the, uh, the Gentiles had not hardened their heart. Uh, to the extent that the, to the same extent they because they didn't have the same exposure. The more exposure you have to truth, like the Jews had, and then to not see the truth for what it is, the ultimate truth, Christ in the flesh, right before them teaching, um, to not see that that is going that can only harden your heart if you don't receive it. Whereas that the Gentiles again they didn't have that light, um, they didn't have that, that that same extent of light. And I believe uh, Hebrews and uh, Second Peter and Jude are direct applications of the parable of the sower, so that it's application of, and their warnings against don't fall away. They're they're epistles to born again believers, uh, confirmed uh, at the very beginning, and he's warning them do not fall away because it's a real possibility. And it it again if you le read the language, uh, it, look for terms uh, like agricultural terms in Second Peter. And Hebrews, and you'll find those agricultural terms, and they're not there by accident. They are direct applications of the parable of the sower. Um, and so it's a real possibility. We, any one of, any one of us, uh, tomorrow I could go into grave error. And that's why Paul said uh, it was a fight for him to keep the faith. I have, he said, I ran the race. I, I've, I've fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. It's a fight to keep the faith. And that's why we're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith. Um, and then finally, with regards to First uh, John, where they, they went away from us because they were not of us, I know that verse is often misabused as well, and um, or misapplied, I believe. And I, I, I particularly study that uh, verses very meticulously. And um, at the beginning of the of the opening of that First uh, John, he says, us, we, us, we. And he, when he's referring to it, he's referring to the apostles themselves in Jerusalem, I believe, that they are the only ones that saw and touched and saw the, the Son of God life manifest before them. He, so he's, he, he's uh, 
he's giving his credentials, essentially, of the apostles in Jerusalem who had spent time, had close fellowship with Jesus Christ himself, who saw him, who touched him, um, and and they were also uh, false false uh, brethren among that 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 church in Jerusalem, and they went out from that from from those apostles. Um, and I believe it, it, it's not like every time a, a believer uh, departs from the faith, it means they were never of us. In fact, the Greek, if you say the word, the Greek were never of us, it means they were never of us. Like they never believed. It was it, it was like uh, I, I can't remember the exact uh, thing, but the terminology, but. It's not like, oh, they believed for a while, and then, then they, they were of us for a little bit, and then they left. It meant the Greek actually says, no, they were never of us. And the reason they departed, I believe, was a, a way for God to tell the apostles, hey, these unbelievers are departing from you, and they are going to be coming, coming to your churches and teaching false doctrine. And that's why that's so it was a way for God to, to notify the apostles that this, of this threat. So it's not like a universal, every time someone departs from the faith, oh, they were never of us. That's a misused and abused because all those pronouns, when he says left us, those are dative pronouns. And dative pronouns, uh, they're not referring to the, when he says us, we, he's not referring to the local congregation he's from talk, he's uh, writing to. He's talking about the, the that, that early church that was in Jerusalem, I believe, um, that they left them. Um, and there's, a, there's other clues for that too. Um, but yeah, again, uh, there are plenty of examples, Galatians, people fall into false doctrine, even if they don't give up the faith altogether, uh, if you don't believe the right gospel, even if you still believe in Christ, for example, but you, you start believing in works, the Bible consider, considers that unbelief. It doesn't consider that belief. Belief in the Bible is uh, belief in the true gospel. Um, it's not, it's not a little bit of error and you still believe. No, if you, if you have a uh, false doctrine, uh, a little leaven, leaven's a whole lump, and the Bible considers that unbelief, categorically. Um, so, um, again, I, 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 we are not saved by our belief. We are, it's, a, it's an act, it's a birth. It's a birth, it's an event. It's a one-way door. Once you enter into heaven, uh, it's a one-way door. You go in, you can't come out. Thank God. It's a picture just like uh, uh, Noah. God shut the door. Uh, Noah didn't shut the door. God shut the door. And he couldn't get out until God said it was okay to. So, you're just example after example after example of the Bible that we're not, it's a, it's an event, not a, a process, or we're not put on probation. It's not based on our continued faithfulness. It's, it's, it's conditioned on a single momentary act of belief in the correct, uh, uh, in the correct gospel. Yep. Uh, wanted to point out, uh, yeah, Ben is right, uh, and that verse should be used only to confirm that there are those that claim to be Christian that are not. Uh, in that First John verse, notice he said they were never right. Of us. So uh, we can also see in First John as he continues, they denied the Lord God that bought them. Uh, so they denied Jesus, and they denied he was the Son of God. Uh, they denied a lot of, they, they were not uh, believers uh, in that sense. But uh, the, the only reason I, I think we can mention that is because there's two things here. There are those that uh, claim to be Christian that never were, people that were never saved. They were never born of God. I heard this one atheist say, I was a born again Christian. No, you weren't, sir. Uh, and if you examine his uh, uh, gospel message, it was Jesus plus his works. He thought that he would get to heaven if he lived up to a certain thing. Now, uh, eternal life is not uh, a process, like he said, it's an actual birth. And so it's not you get into heaven if you live a really good life and keep the faith until you die. And that's what most people think. If I do that, that is your righteousness. Jesus, he is savior. When you are rescued, you are the passive participant. And that's what we are. We got nothing, folks, nothing. We are helpless. We can't help Jesus save us. Nothing we're doing is helping us be saved or stay saved. Jesus is Savior. He is Rescuer. 
Okay, we're helpless. And that's what people don't get. That it's not Jesus, plus you got to live a really good Christian life and then you'll be saved. Not that we're against living a good Christian life. We believe it. We believe that the reason the world is as it is is because of the hypocrisy of those claiming to know Jesus, but don't. We are all for living a good, godly Christian life, being different from the world, loving more than the world, forgiving more than the world. We believe all these things. But security comes from knowing that salvation is in the hands of God and not in our hands. He offered it to us by his grace. We received it by faith. We heard the message of what Jesus did for us and we trusted it. We said, that's it. That That's what's going to get me into heaven. It's just his blood. It has nothing to do with me. And how good is God that he did that for me? He gave me his righteousness so that I could stand before him because the blood cleansed me from all unrighteousness. And this spiritual birth, that man, he's a new man created in the likeness of Jesus. Nothing can corrupt that image. My flesh, the failure in my flesh cannot corrupt that spiritual image that is made in the image of God. And one day he will give me a glorified body to go with that. And we will be just like Jesus. We're already seated in heavenly places. So when people say these things, they are ignorant of God's righteousness. They are ignorant of what Jesus actually accomplished on the cross. And they think they're keeping themselves saved by how faithful they are. But Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's not going to kick you out for anything. He said, I will in no wise cast them out. So if you come unto him, if you come to him as savior and you say, your Lord and savior, please, you know, I'm going to accept what you gave me because I, I can't do it. I, I need to rely on what you did on your blood. He will in no wise cast you out. If your faith fails or whatever, we're told to wear the helmet of salvation. That is surround your mind, protect your mind from anything that would come against the message of salvation in Christ. That is where security, your feeling of security comes from. The reason we're so secure on the panel and many of you are is because you're constantly feeding your mind with the truth of the foundation that's Jesus. And that is how you protect yourself from false teachers. A lot of people get saved and then they get zealous for God. They get on fire for the Lord. They sit under false teaching because it sounds right to their ears, you know, because they're, they're, they're preaching good things to do. Stay away from sin, be different than the world, give to your church, help the poor. Amen. But they're telling you to do that for salvation. And so that's how we get under the wrong teaching and it builds up into confusion. So yes, uh, once saved, always saved. Once in Christ, always in Christ. You can't take yourself out. He said, no man can. And Jesus won't cast you out because we have a faithful God. People say these things because they act like salvation's in their own hands. And it's not. It's in God's. You are his. He knew from the foundation of the world. He's not going to give you to Jesus and then Jesus can't keep you. He's not an Indian giver. So these, these doctrines come around because they misunderstand verses. And, you know, a uh, matter of fact, the, the wording of the question makes me think that they misunderstood it. Okay, grounded in the gospel. Here we go. What I hear here is somebody read that verse that says, if, uh, if you remain grounded in the truth or something like that, they think that means you only go to heaven if you remain grounded in truth. When that, I believe that verse is actually saying you'll be without rebuke. You'll yeah. be uh, without correction if you remain grounded in the truth. But they're saying you only get saved if you remain. They're looking for bad news because people want to boast and how faithful they are. They want to believe people can lose it. They want to believe what they're doing counts. It's really, really bad. It all comes from uh, bad theology is all it is. That people... Anybody claiming to be Christian needs to go back to the foundation day one and understand what was accomplished by Jesus on the cross, what imputed righteousness is, what his blood did for us, why we're secure. They need to understand that because you cannot even grow. 
You cannot do anything good unless you're abiding in him. You've got to be in Christ first. It, they shouldn't even move on until they got that right, until they understand the detail of it. Because I don't really think you can you can live in joy and peace in the Lord, serving him with gratitude and joy. If you're constantly confused about where, I mean, how can you have gratitude and joy and peace if you're not really sure if you lived up to it? You know, because if we're honest, none of us live up to it no matter how good we think we live. Uh, all the people I know that are saved by grace, you know, if you sat down and listed the Ten Commandments, we hadn't broken them that day. I mean, according to the letter of the law, but to Jesus's standards, we all still break them. We have thoughts and intents of the heart. We say things that we shouldn't. You know, it's, it's just that people do not understand that the law really is, you know, it says we established the law. It's way up here. And people tend to think that they're keeping it or that they're better or something. It's just crazy. And security doesn't come from that. It, it comes from the foundation being Jesus. Your security uh, is because of our savior and what he's done and his promises, not because your faith is so great. Yeah, I think that was a. The, actually, you're right. I think the, the question was alluding to Colossians one twenty three, um, and it's talking about if you're grounded and steadfast, uh, you'll be blameless, unreprovable in His sight. And if you look up the, that those phrases in His sight, in the sight of God, or the sight of the Lord, uh, nearly every occasion, or or in the sight of men, every occasion, it's in the here and now. It's not uh, in eternal in His sight. It's not in that perspective. It's not in that context. The context is in God's sight here and now. So if you say grounded and steadfast now in the gospel, you will you are uh, blameless, uh, unreprovable in his sight. Why? That's because, a great point. Because you're believing in the in the correct gospel. But if you fall fall you know fall either to the ditch of legalism or you drift off into the in the ditch of license or into any false doctrine, well you're not uh, blameless or un, without reproach in his sight in the present. Yeah. But that's a great point about it in the here and now, temporally. A lot of people mix up temporal with eternal. Our position with our uh, performance, they, they mix it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, a lot of great points were made. Uh, it reminds me of a video I, I've recommended so many times over the years uh, by a YouTuber. Uh, I think it's a Street Preacher 1611 is the name of the channel. I'm not sure the channel still even exists. If you can find it, there's a there's a video titled Standing in State. Uh, and it, he, he uses those um, like puppet characters. You know, I forgot what it is. There's some kind of a program where you can uh, have people, you actually have a voice, but instead of a picture of a person, it's some kind of a puppetized person. And it, it's an excellent video to show you this, make this very point that our standing before God doesn't change. Uh, we're a child of God, born again, irrevocable. Uh, but our state, uh, that, that changes throughout our life. There's, what kind of a state are we in our walk? <clears throat> uh, yeah, good points made by first about First John. Um, I, I'll have to look more closely at uh, that, uh, Ben, uh, interesting the way you so see that. Uh, and the, the parable of the sowers, um, uh, th th there's always been a, a difference between the grace believers and the lordshippers in how to interpret this these five groups. Uh, I mean, these uh, four groups. The um, uh, I believe that the first group where the seed fell by the wayside and was snatched by the birds, this is the group that never believed and are not saved. And the other groups, uh, the shallow ground, the thorny ground, and the good soil, uh, they, they all are believers that are saved. Uh, but the, the Lordship heresy, they would say, no, uh, uh, it's only the last group because they're going to argue that the others, they either did not produce any fruit, in other words, they didn't have the changed lives, uh, you know, repenting of sins and, and becoming religious and all those things. 
or or, or they uh, they had problems with their 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 faith because of the pers either persecution or troubles of the world, and so the Lord shippers argue that no, there's only the last group is saved. The grace believers normally believe that only the first group was unsaved, but on what grounds do you decide that? Um, uh, we we should agree that our works are, are, are not the deciding factor. What is it? And it's the new birth. And I believe that, uh, the, to me, the test in that parable uh, to, to determine the standing of each group uh, is the fact that all the groups except the first, the seeds sprang to life. And that is a, an illustration that there was regeneration, there was a quickening as the Bible says, which means our spirit was brought to life. And that only happens with a believer. And when it happens, it's permanent. Um, all right. Um, any more from you, either of you? Brother oh, yeah. Luke, we could, we could do a whole program just on this topic. I mean, honestly, we really could. Uh, but again, uh, this whole uh, question comes from, like Ben was showing us, bad theology, just not understanding the difference between temporal and performance and eternal position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. If there's no more, Ben, would you uh, read the, the next question? Sure will. Okay. The next question, uh, quite kind of lengthy here, but it says, with, with demonology, I've heard lots of theories where people say there is a spirit of this, of this, and in parentheses, or in parentheses, it says murder, bad thoughts, laziness, violence, overeating, etc., and a spirit of that. In other words, there are lots of different areas of responsibilities for demons, which sounds kind of ridiculous to me. Then some people theorize there are demons over places like the demons, like the demon of Suffolk, then the demon of Virginia, then the demon of the East, then the demon of the USA than the demon of the Western nations. For a start, doesn't anyone think it's a bit silly to try and come up with, a theor with theories that the Bible does not really say anything about? The Bible just gives us basic information, like there are demons, ranks, Satan is the head, don't do anything to make contact with them, uh, exam for example, the occult, and that's it. What do you think of all of this? Should we even be speculating about roles of demons in the first place or just leave it as opinion only? As some people speak very specific things, like there's a demon of violence, a demon of lust, as absolute fact, when the Bible says no such thing, or maybe <coughs> may say very basic things but nothing else. That's, that's it. So basically a question about, uh, you know, to what extent should we be uh, teaching or... Uh, you know, teaching that there's different classes of demons and they have their, their roles and responsibilities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Renee, what's the answer? Well, I, I'd have to say the question itself concerns me because the city and state and country I live in was in that question. I noticed that too. Yeah. So, um, well, let, let me say this. You know, there's that old saying, if you stare into the darkness, the darkness stares back. We're, we're not told to study the kingdom of darkness. If Christians spend as much time in their Bible as they did seeking out demons in their hierarchy, uh, we'd have a lot more power in the church. But um, I... In, I go by scripture and the scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That is, a, they, they're called the prince of, and a principality is a prince or a uh, high ranking demonic fallen entity over an area, a country, uh, a nation, a city. Uh, and yeah, uh, when they call themselves legion, we know that there is some kind of order to the kingdom of darkness. They have their generals and their whatever. Uh, there's, you know, ones that rule over many. A legion is like six, about 6,000 soldiers. So uh, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, 
and spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, uh, high places in scripture are places of worship. Now, a lot of people change the high places to mean the sky. High places are places of worship, false worship, idolatry. Uh, for instance, in scripture, it says that we know where Satan's seat is. It was in Pergamos, which is in Turkey. And it was where the temple of Zeus stood. So we know that he gets worshipped by proxy uh, through these idols. And so we don't need to know. I see a lot of these uh, Pentecostals going, there's a, a demon of murder. There's a demon of fear here. There's a spirit of anger. There's a spirit of this. I, you know, and a lot of people think you got to know the name of the devil. You don't have to know the name. None of that. The only reason Jesus asked who he was is because I think in scripture, we're supposed to know it's more than one. Uh, and so, and the power of Jesus, you know, to cast them all out with just a word, not uh, crucifixes and, and carved idols and Latin prayers, uh, but a word through the power of the Holy Spirit prayer. I think the greatest defense against the demonic is prayer and the word of God. The Bible says the word of God is the sword of the spirit. Devils hate it. They hate it. So I, I think that's our best defense. And I think scripturally, we're not supposed to accuse or get arrogant with these demonic entities. Michael, the archangel, didn't even, like it said, make a railing accusation against Satan when they were debating over Moses' body. He said, the Lord rebuke you, not I rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. He turned him over to the power of God. So I disagree with a lot of this Pentecostal stuff. Uh, if somebody is, is screaming and raging, of course there's a spirit of anger. I mean, I don't need to see in the spirit to know that. The guy's raging. Uh, if somebody's uh, hating on somebody, yeah, there's a spirit of murder. Hatred is murder. Uh, Jesus told us that if you hate someone with that, uh, you, you want, you murdered them. So to me, some of this stuff is for performance. Uh, I I've seen a lot of it, a lot of it that I just, I do not believe is, is actually the power of God casting anything out. Uh, too much performance. It's a show for everybody. And it's there to boost the ego of the preacher doing it. I see that all over the place. I've only seen one exorcism that I thought was legitimate. And it was a gentleman. He had the real gospel. He was on the street corner and a little Asian man walked up to him. Very timid, very scared and said, I am I, I believe I'm possessed. I'm, I, I don't know what to do. He saw him street preaching the gospel. Okay. He walked up to him and he told him that the gentleman very calmly put his hand on his shoulder. He preached the gospel to him. He calmly cast the thing out, told it it had to go. The guy spit up a little bit and then hugged him and walked away. Wasn't eventful, nothing flying around the room. Uh, can that happen? Yeah. You know, they can levitate and do their little paranormal parlor tricks. Uh, but that's the only time I've ever seen someone cast the devil out that I thought was a legitimate thing. Uh, yeah, I've done that in a house. But as far as human beings, I have not. Uh, I haven't come across anybody I believe is actually possessed. I have prayed over people that were oppressed. I've done that kind of thing. But please, people. I know it's interesting and it gets our curiosity, but just there's no need for us to go peering into the darkness and knowing the details of it. I, I know too much of it from being in the occult and you can get sucked in to the occult through curiosity and good intentions. You can. So just be very careful about it. You don't have to know all this about how they work. You have to know how Jesus works and he works through the, the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. So I think we need to focus on that and do the good we're supposed to do. Yeah, it says one of the things we're commanded to do is cast out devils. Absolutely. If you run across someone that you believe is actually possessed uh, and you're an elder, you need to get some 
uh, fellow elders, uh, secure in the Lord, preach the gospel to them and cast that thing out. Absolutely, you need to do that. That's one of the commands. But what I'm seeing here, a lot of it I'm seeing, I think is performance. And it's for mesmer mesmerizing others and lifting up the preacher like he's something great. So um, be very careful when you're looking into the darkness like that. That That's what I would say. You don't need to know all that mess. Mm -hmm. Amen. Good advice. <clears throat> um, I, I know that there are a number of televangelists who are very popular who are putting on a show of great a performance. It's it's very well planned and orchestrated and, and uh the the uh, presentation is is uh, you know almost like a a play that they're putting on, uh, but it is it is I believe in pretty much every case I I would doubt I don't think I'm aware of any that I, I would not judge as I think that's fake um, I'm very uh, skeptical of all all those things especially the things that are uh, clearly not biblical like. Benny Hinn waving his coat and everybody falling down and that that kind of thing is just theatrics and but there's a lot of gullible people that fall for all that um, um, when you I think this question is really very interesting uh, it's, a, it's certainly different I've never heard it questioned in that way um, but I, I, when it says the spirit of uh, I, I'm not sure we should take that term, the spirit of um, being an actual entity, but rather a, an attitude. In other words, like, well, you, well he, has, he has a spirit of anger. In other words, he has, is he an angry person? It's, a, it's an attitude. Spirit of means an attitude of, rather than thinking in terms of demons necessarily. Um, but I think it's a big mistake that... Um, you know, whether it's this subject or anything in the Bible where not much is said, and yet you extrapolate into an entire novels and volumes of books on a subject <laughs> like demonology. Uh, so um, it's uh, some people they they specialize in these things. They get really focused on it, and that's their that's their niche. But uh, they end up. Uh, State stating a lot of things where I say, where does that say that in the Bible? So they get, you know, the Bible gives you this much information, but you're providing this much information for us. Well, where'd the rest of it come from? Well, you're making it all up. You're just doing a lot of speculating and, and, and extrapolating on, on, the, on the scriptures. Um, okay, Ben, what, what, what do you say about all this? Well, you guys covered it quite well. And I, I like your last point, Luke. I was thinking the same thing about the spirit. Um, I think it sometimes does refer to an actual spirit, like a demon, uh, but also sometimes, like you said, like a, like an attitude, um, like a spirit of fear, for example. Um, the, uh, but at the same time, I do believe. Um, so, for example, um, in Deuteronomy, um, let's see here, Deuteronomy. Uh, it says, okay, so in Deut Deuteronomy, verse thirty-two, seven. Uh, I believe this this passage here is referring to what happened at Babel, essentially, where God divided up the nations, and uh, he, uh, he basically the the quote unquote fallen sons of God were were given authority, uh, essentially temporary authority or governing authority over these uh, these Gentile nations, because it says in Deuteronomy thirty two seven it says, "Remember the days of old." Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High divided the, divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the, the number of the sons of God. Some translations say uh, sons of Israel, but the, 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 the Hebrew clearly says sons of God. Um, so it says the sons of God for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. And so uh, I believe that there's a, a common th a, a thread throughout the Bible where it basically teaches that at Babel, uh, God divided up the nations, the son, the corrupt sons of God, uh, where, which are confronted uh, in Job and things like that. 
Uh, there's other verses too where God says that they they uh, they um, are they 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 rule unjustly. They don't uh, uh, they don't uh, uphold justice for the widow or the orphan. Um, and I believe also too, like for example, Paul says that Gentiles who sacrifice to demons uh, uh, to idols are they sacrifice to demons. And so I think these sons of God they did divide up the God divided up the the, the world. And Jacob, Israel, was his inheritance from which he would restore. Uh, the, the Messiah would come, obviously, and he would. Uh, he basically disinherited the agent, uh, nations for a while, and then they're they're reconciled uh, it, back to him in Christ uh, as believers. But uh, yeah, so in terms of principalities, uh, these sons of God they do rule over the nations in some respects, and I think there's like angel or not. Renee said there's probably some kind of hierarchy that I'm not super aware of, but they, they, I think that's where a lot of the false gods came from. They, you know, they masquerade as, as they don't really care what you believe as long as it's not the truth. And, uh, they probably take many on many faces. Um, and, you know, again, the gods of Egypt, for example, I'm sure, I'm sure Satan's at the head, but he's got, uh, people under him, uh, that are represented as sub gods, if you will. And, um, but also too, like, it, I think there are some, it's so like, for example, there is, there are cases in the Bible where I think Christ said that, you know, he is a deaf and dumb spirit. Um, in that case, uh, again, I don't think this necessarily the spirit, um, that's all that he does. He's responsible for all deaf and dumbness in people. It's just that, uh, that spirit, uh, that was one way he was oppressing that particular individual but like you said luke i think it's hard to be dogmatic or extrapolate on things that the bible only gives us a very limited information on and i like what renee said too is that a lot of people spend so much time studying the darkness um that they that it almost swallows them up and um it, it does defile you over time it defiles you and it makes you weak so it's important that you only get you know it, 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 I, I would recommend stick with the Bible and believe the Bible and it will save you a lot of trouble and a lot of heartache to looking into that stuff yourself. So the Bible gives you the, the, the amount of information that you need to know about it and that's it. Ben, I wanted to say that I'm very impressed. Uh, I haven't heard anybody else mention the sons of God. A lot of people believe that's where the 70 or the 72, it changes depending on the text. Right. Uh, Ars Goetia, the, the gate demons, as they're called, or the gatekeepers that people use in the occult. It's it's over all the principalities that ruled over each nation when they were separated into 70 or 72. I don't know. But uh, that's where that comes from. And there's also a judgment on these entities for being unjust rulers. You shall fall. You shall die like men. You shall yeah. fall like the princes. Right. So, yeah, they're they're. They're claiming a judgment over these spiritual entities. And I've seen people do Bible gymnastics trying to take that away because they don't want the sons of God to be spiritual beings in the Old Testament. But they clearly were. Uh, that's because they try to make the sons of God in Genesis 6 human, which they clearly are not. Sons of God right. in the Old Testament are clearly the Benai Elohim or the angelic uh, entities, which look like men. I don't know. People don't realize that in the Bible, angels look like human beings. They were mistaken as human beings. So, um, you know, uh, I was going to say, there's a, a, a Jesus quotes to, to the Pharisees that verse that says, you know, have you not read you are gods? And I don't think he's, yeah, and I think he's basically saying to them, hey, you're just like, you're, you're acting, you're in position of authority. Uh, you're acting just like the corrupt sons of God. You judge unjustly. Um and I think that's how he's applying that there. And he's confirming himself as the son. Yes, of yes, yes. So they're trying to assault him for some kind of blasphemy. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. yep. You're absolutely right. But uh, the prosperity teachers take that wrong. That, uh, you know, we are little God's doctrine from that. That is really heretical. That's where they get it to. Unfortunately, uh, my father... Uh, he was a, a, a cultist, a new ager, very much into Edgar Casey. He, he uh, my family would go into uh, hypnotic trances and regressions into past lives, they would say. 
uh, and all, all, all of that stuff. Uh, so they were very involved with all this stuff. But um, he argued with me once when I was trying to share the Bible and the gospel with him uh, that uh, it, he's just as much God as Jesus. And I, I was just shocked when I heard him say that. It was, it was just devastating to, me to hear him say it. But uh, he says, don't, the Bible says, don't ye know that ye too are gods? So, and I wasn't that familiar with, with the verse. So I said, well, when we get home, we we're out to lunch. I, we got home and I said, let's look it up and find out what it says there. And <clears throat> found out that when you go back to the context in the Old Testament, uh, it wasn't, it, it, the conclusion you come to is totally different than the way that he wanted to use it to support this new age thing that we, we, we all, on our path to become gods. Um, I, I, and then as I watched him in his last moments dying, I you know, sh again shared the gospel, and, but he couldn't speak because he was on all the equipment and di dying, and I hope he believed in the end. But so of course, there are people that are, we know that are argue that people can't get saved on their, on their deathbed. So uh, I certainly, certainly disagree with that. Yes. Uh, but I'm uh, regarding this question here, uh, one thing I wanted to add is that uh, I believe it's wise for us to try to avoid uh, engaging in this arena as much as possible. Now, you can't escape the reality that there is a spiritual war going on. And uh, especially if you're busy working for the Lord, you know, the, the demons want to try to uh, inhibit and you uh, be not... Uh, prevent you from being successful. Uh, but um, uh, if, if you are someone that really is interested in this and, you know, this is a fascinating subject, and, well, I, I think you're really asking for trouble. It's kind of like the people who play around with the Ouija board and then go get possessed like in The Exorcist, you know. No, we know Christians can't be possessed, but uh, I, I just would say that if you're, you're asking for trouble, you probably ought to avoid the subject unless you're confronted and can't can't not. Um, um, all right. Um, I, I guess I, any more, Renee? I, I want to say one more thing. This is how I have seen the spirit realm work most successfully in stealth. The enemy won't let you know he's there. He does his best work not manifesting. Because the minute he manifests, you can overtly fight him, right? So the most damage I believe the kingdom of darkness does is in stealth. When they're manipulating things from behind the scenes, leading you back to addictions you might have, leading you into temptations or having you run into people that you know you could get in trouble with, you used to hang out with, putting obsessive thoughts in your mind that condemn you. Um, he's going to either try to overwhelm you with troubles so that you're not thankful to God and, and you're uh, neglecting your spiritual life, which I've been guilty of before, or he's going to shower you with things of the world to keep your eyes occupied, nice glittery things, a career, money, uh, women, whatever. If he can't get you with that, then he's going to turn to things that trouble you, problems you have, uh, anything that can take your eyes off the mission you're given as a Christian. And that is to save souls and to set people free, tell them the good news of the love of God. So the biggest damage I think the kingdom of darkness is doing is all from stealth mode. It's not people foaming at the mouth and head spinning around and levitating and that that's a rare very 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 small percentage of stuff he doesn't want to be seen so all these people claiming that out of a thousand people in their church a hundred are manifesting i i just i'm sorry i i think most of the time they are hidden and hidden well they don't want you to know that they're behind the scenes trying to destroy the Christian's life. You know, so uh, I think the better thing is to be prayed up, to be Jesus focused, 
You know, someone asked in the chat room, is it sinful to study the occult? It's not sinful, but why would you? What, what do you mean the, study it? I'm not bringing those books in my house. When I used to have that stuff in my house, I, I can't even tell you the stuff that I went through. I'm not talking just supernatural stuff. I'm talking about the angst and the darkness that surrounded my life, including types of people I attracted. It's just bad idea. Why would you? Why would you gonna why would you research a lesser power, the losing side, when Jesus has given us everything for the winning side? We should focus, Paul tells us, you know, you don't focus on darkness and the occult and all that. They're mentioned, the sorcery books are mentioned in scripture. What, what happened with them? They burned them. Burn them. Get rid of that mess. And keep your eyes on Jesus. Get, get your head filled not with occult knowledge, not with understanding how the demonic hierarchy works, but with the word of God. We're the helmet of salvation. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. And even if they took every paper or digital copy, if your head and heart are filled with it, they can never take it from you. That is the power. The power resides in the spirit and in the word of God. And that is what we should be focusing on. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I guess... Um... It's getting time for us to uh, start uh, finishing up. Uh, it's almost time has really flown by, hasn't it? <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, only 14 minutes before the top of the hour when we usually quit. So, uh, um, Brother Lou. Yes. Before we close, I, uh, uh, Christine, she, she made a great point. I, I want to do this before we move on. Mm -hmm. She said, assigning specific sin to a devil is is blaming the devil and not the person it's like well i couldn't help it i had a demon of anger uh and i had a demon of addiction i had a demon of alcohol in me so it, ta it it just takes all the responsibility off the person well it's not my fault i had a demon of such and such you know and she makes mm -hmm. a great point there mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a very good point. Thank you, Chris Annie. Uh, all right, I guess uh, we should uh, start summing up our, our thoughts and uh, we, we need a gospel message uh, and some encouragement, uh, exhortation. Uh, uh, Renee, would you, would you like to give the gospel message? And, sure, sure. Uh, Okay, so uh, Ben, do you have any inspirational thoughts, or uh, do you would you prefer I do it, or whatever? What would I would like? like to, I would like to hear some inspirational thoughts uh, after your latest trial. If you're up for it, if you're not up for it, I, I can I can come up with something. All right, <clears throat> All right I'll, I'll do that. Uh, let's start start off with you then, Ben. Uh, give us your uh, your thoughts on this time together today. Well, I just want to say that it's such a uh, spiritual uplift to have you Luke back, Luke. Uh, it has not been the same without you, and uh, it just feels like we. I have my old uh, cozy blanket with me again. <laughs> um, no, I, I just love, I love having. Uh, it's not the same without you, and it's it's so great. I knew you would come back. You're you're strong like bull, and nothing can nothing can hold keep you down for long. And uh, you look good. You sound good. Uh, it sounds like you're well on your way to recovery. I'm sure you're, you're again. You're probably going to be struggling with uh, various things uh, for the next week or so. But um, it's amazing uh, uh, that from what the sounds of what you went through, uh, that you said you never felt sicker is amazing. Um, that uh, that you've come back and and uh, are able to participate like this. And we ought, definitely is a testament to all the prayers that I know so many people were uh, heaping uh, on you. And so, um, but other than that, it was a, it was a great uh, program, um, and uh, I, I guess that's it. So, uh, looking forward to uh, to uh, well, I, actually, I'd be interested to say about the if you have any uh, um, news about the interviews. That'd be uh, if you have anything to say about that, be uh, we'd be uh, interested in hearing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... 
All right, uh, Renee, uh, let's hear your uh, summary and, and, and uh, gospel message. Uh, ben, is it possible for you to put that uh, sentence up again? And then Renee, if, if you if you don't mind, maybe you could read that one sentence and then extra, then you can just expand upon it however you like to-, to, uh, yeah, to Let me see if I can see it. Uh, I'm, I'm putting it up right now. It should be on your screen within 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and brother Luke, you just get better before we start the interviews. Let's let you, you know. Okay. You're already going to do Wednesday and Sunday. Let's give it a week and see. Yeah. How it yeah. All right. So I see water here. I don't. Okay. See in a second. It. In a second, you're going to see the words. Okay, here it is. All right. God became a man, Jesus Christ, and He died on the cross to pay for all our sins and was raised bodily from the dead to guarantee the gift of eternal life and heaven to all that believe that Jesus Christ alone provides salvation and eternal life through faith in him alone. Um, yeah, uh, it's interesting that God became a man. It, it's true, he did. I had someone get mad at me and said, oh, John 3.16 doesn't say God so loved the world that he became a man. And I said, well, if you look in scripture, it says that God manifested in the flesh and that Jesus was Emmanuel. God with us. And the Feast of Tabernacles represents God coming and tabernacling with us, wearing the tent of a man, a tabernacle of a man, the body, the temple of a man. And uh, it's clear that Jesus is God, and the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, and we can only reconcile a lot of these verses because they are all God, uh, one God in three distinct persons. That's how love existed in the Godhead without creation, eternally existing God. But he could give and receive love within himself in the Godhead. So yes, Jesus is divine. He said he was the bread that came down from heaven, uh, that before Abraham was, I am. Uh, the I am sent Moses to free the Israelites. It's the same God. So, um, and that's why they put him to death for blasphemy. The Jews knew what he was saying. I don't know why now these days people uh, deny his divinity. The Jews are very clear that Jesus was who he was claiming to be. And they rent their clothes in response to it. So uh, Jesus left heaven. That's how much he loved man. And this was the plan before the world began. Jesus is called the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That was God's plan all along. He knew Adam would fall, but he had a plan to redeem man and restore him into his family. When Adam fell, every person became mortal. We all inherited sin and a death sentence because the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus died for us. Jesus paid that death penalty for every man. It said he tasted death for every man when he died on the cross for our sins. Because every person born has born, was born in sinful flesh. And so when Jesus died, he not only paid our sin debt, he fulfilled God's law as a man for man. And he became our sin, even though he didn't commit any sin. That's how we can become God's righteousness without doing any righteousness. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We need God's righteousness. And we get that when we trust what Jesus did on Calvary. That is death, burial, and resurrection. Three days later, he rose again as promised in the scriptures. The sign of Jonah is what Jesus called it, as Jonah was in the heart of the whale or fish for three days and three nights. So is Jesus going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights? And he defeated death, offering his own blood on the mercy seat of heaven. And we know his blood was accepted on our behalf because he rose again. So that is how we're restored to God, where our immortality is restored. We never die. Jesus said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And the woman there, thought, yeah, yeah, I know I'll see my brother again at the resurrection. Jesus is like, oh, no, no. No, whosoever, I am the resurrection and the life. 
whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So we step right out of this body, present with the Lord, and he will give us a glorified body. We will be just like Jesus in a physical body, just like he has now. And he restored what Adam lost, our fellowship with God. We're born into God's family. We're given a glorified body. So Jesus did all of that by his death on Calvary, living the perfect sinless life, the son of the living God, eternally existing, left heaven, came here, died on the cross, paid for the sins of mankind. And all he asked is that we believe he did it for us. He did save us. And if you trust that he saved you, he gives you eternal life. It's only his blood. His blood is the sacrifice, the payment for sin, because the wages of sin is death. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's what it says in scripture. And you know, the natural man cannot receive that. They, they can't understand that at all. Uh, and so all we can do is tell people that good news and pray for them. And the rest is left up to God. He's the author and finisher of our faith. You cannot be unborn. You're born of God when you trust what Jesus did. He promises eternal life to anyone who trusts in him. And that is the good news. God's not a liar. It was so good to have you back, Brother Luke. Thank you, sister. All right. Um, I noticed that uh, today is December 6th, and this is a very significant date for me because it was December 6th of 1986 that my mother died, and it, I hadn't ever faced any loss like that in my family or friends. No one had died. I was 36 years old, and uh, uh, for the first time in my life, I felt really desperate, like, well, I need to find out what happens after we die and what's the purpose of life, and which religion is true, what about the Bible. And uh, so uh, today, uh, I did not get saved on December 6th, but it wasn't long after that. It was a matter of a couple of weeks uh, because uh, I, I, that's when I began to study the Bible, and as I went through it and learned the gospel in Jesus I uh, and believed. So this is roughly about 34 years ago that I was born again. Uh, now the uh, I, I went to college here in, in Las Vegas, uh, uh, graduated in 1974. And uh, one of my lo oldest friendships that's endured is, is a uh, a friend, a friend of mine named Mike. Uh, I won't give you his last name, but uh, Mike is—he's a brother in the, in the respect that we are. I met him in a fraternity. I joined a fraternity, and uh, and we're fraternity brothers. But many of us in that fraternity have maintained a friendship now for about fifty years. Um, and of course, Mike knows me quite well from my younger days, and it, the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and, 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 and life of uh, people coming up, at, going through the 70s, uh, it was a very decadent and, and uh, uh, hedonistic. Uh, and, and of course, uh, so, but he, he's maintained his friendship, and so we, we've talked over the years. He's seen what happened, uh, the changes in my life, and the and the uh, continuous faith and study of the scriptures uh, over the years many times uh, I can't tell you I'm just guessing at least ten times over the many years I've had pretty lengthy talks with him about theology and uh, Christianity and um, we've always had cordial conversations it never it never got uh, offend, offended by either of us. But uh, he, he was always interested, but he, he really was first an atheist. And then I saw, well, now he's an agnostic. Uh, and, and, and now, but now he's, he's I would call him a deist. Uh, he, he's absolutely certain that God does exist, that there is a creator. 
but as far as a personal God, the God of the Bible, uh, theism, uh, he hasn't gone that far yet. But <clears throat> since I was sick, a lot of people have called me the last few weeks. And just last couple of days, I've been able to talk again. So I got in a lengthy conversation with Mike about uh, about the Bible again. And, and uh, he is so close. I mean, he's, he's a couple of years older than me. And he's really quite ill, not with COVID, but he just has all kinds of health issues. Uh, I mean, he could he could die any time now, and it wouldn't surprise anybody because of all the health issues. So as we get older and we know that death is getting closer, uh, we get more open-minded, I think, about, hey, I, I, maybe I need some answers. And that's where he is. And uh, the conversation we had was very good. And he's so close uh, to, to believing. His, his, I told him the final thought. I said, look, I like to say that in the, in the Bible, let's say there's a hundred things in the Bible that you can learn. Uh, you, you, could, you could be wrong about 98 out of 100, but there's just two things you better get right. And that is, who is Jesus and how do I get to heaven? And, and, and it's because he was concerned with a lot of questions that he, there are difficult questions that we try to answer for people and, and not being persuaded yet, not, not being convinced that, that, you know, the answers are good enough. And so the point I left him with is, look, no, you, you can't, you cannot wait for uh, to feel like I've got everything explained, everything, all my answers, questions are answered, uh, because uh, that's never going to happen. I said, I, look, Mike, I've studied the Bible for 34 years now, and I, I don't have it all figured out. There's a lot of things I still have, I'm not sure about, um, but I'm sure of this, that this gospel. And so if you could just realize that that's the most important thing right now. You, you have 75 years you've lived, but that's nothing compared to eternity. So what's the most important thing in your life right now is, is resolving this and, and, and coming to some faith or, or not. That, that's what will determine your, your fate. And so um, that's the same thing with a lot of people is that they're waiting to get every possible objection answered instead of just saying, I don't need it all answered. Uh, all I need is uh, this faith and trust in this person that promises uh, he, he has eternal life for me. So I'm asking everybody to pray for Mike since he is so close and he's, he's close to, to faith and he's close to death. So pray for Mike. Uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is these uh, scriptures that, uh, to me, if I wanted to encourage anybody, uh, I go to Philippians 8, I mean, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Uh, it's a terrible thing that's happening in the country and the world uh, now. Uh, it's a lot, difficult, a lot of difficulty for everybody, but if at all possible, think on these things. All right. I, it's such a great pleasure and joy for me to be able to be back with everybody again. So thank you very much. Um, I guess, uh, let me see. We've all said our summary remarks. Anything was, anybody want to say anything about before I close out? Okay. Thank you, uh, Renee and Ben. And thank you for the whole congregation today. Uh, Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.